welcome to the vantage point. You know, in contrast to the multinuclei theory of human origins, archaeological evidence points to East Central Africa as the hearth or original homeland of modern humans. Despite some minor disagreements among geneticists, their work is lending support to the out of Africa theory. Spencer Wells with the National Geographic Society's research in genetics, for example, suggests that every living person on the planet is descended from a man who lived in an East African valley some 60,000 years ago. You should note that biologists as well as Christians, Jews, and Muslims share common ground on the location of the birthplace of modern humans. However, as Oxford University geneticist Brian Sykes, historian Helen A. Gaudet, and paleoanthropologist G. A. Clark point out, modern people had already left Africa and were in Israel some 40,000 years earlier. Mitochondrial DNA, which is passed from generation to generation along the female line, men can carry it, but they don't pass it along, builds a case for a small band of immigrating Africans that included one woman or her recent descendants, who was the maternal ancestor of all non-African peoples. Nevertheless, and despite debates among theologians and scientists about the precise date for modern humans, first migrations out of Africa, the way in which these earliest people used geographic knowledge to cope with the forces of nature, deserves a lot of our appreciation. That was a major theme in my book, The Forces of Nature, Our Quest to Conquer the Planet. It's now in its second edition. Long before Eratosthenes, the ancient Greek scholar who coined the name geography to identify his work and my passion, he didn't know it was my passion, but it is, our ancestors used their practical and accumulating knowledge of uh, human environmental interactions for their survival. For reasons that no one is determined, modern humans, us, lingered in what is today Israel and the Near East for 50,000 years. That's a long time. The Pleistocene, or the last Great Ice Age, was certainly an intervening obstacle for northward migrations. It's also likely that the area was a temperate land with lush meadows and green forests. Plentiful game made life easy for hunters. Given that the Out of Africa movement took place during a time in which ice blanketed much of the upper middle and high latitudes like Germany and, and Siberia, they most likely used their time in that portion of the Near East to develop technology or adapt to make living in the colder reaches of Europe and Asia possible. Almost simultaneously in geological time, it took another 38,000 years for modern people to settle the farthest reaches of Western Europe and the Americas. The migration routes of those earliest explorers and pioneering migrants are well marked by archaeological evidence deposited during the late Paleolithic Age and, more recently, the Mesolithic Era, which ended about 5,000 years ago. Genetic material and artifacts left behind in caves and buried under peat and layers of other sediment tell us much about how they perceived, interacted, and responded to their environments. Their perceptions of the environment and interactions are important for us to consider because the decisions that they made regarding where to live and what materials to use outlined with minor revisions made possible through technological innovations over the last 200 years, the boundaries of our ecumene or inhabited space. We know for instance are certain that through the Mesolithic era at least, most people were hunters and gatherers. As such, their survival depended heavily, if not entirely, on finding and following food supplies, traveling in small bands of people who were perhaps sometimes spurred on just by curiosity about what lay over the next hill or mountain. They formed migration routes through valleys, plains, and mountain passes. Migration routes extended away from the Near East until land gave way to sea, and then, through ingenuity, some people constructed small boats and moved on following coastlines where kelp beds rich with life served them well. As hunters and gatherers, the pursuit of game and plants that gave them their sustenance, sounds like uh, man versus wild or something, uh, lured them across new and unfamiliar lands. These Paleolithic and Mesolithic peoples left their stone tools and genetic signatures behind them. 
as they established settlements on six of the Earth's seven continents. Most of those early settlements were semi-permanent. In geological time frame, humans have only claimed dominion over those six continents for a minuscule amount of time, about 12,000 years. While genes and artifacts make it possible to recreate their routes and the reasons for them, comparisons to them with our present-day population clusters reveals the depth of their geosophy, that's geographic knowledge, and the sustainability of the ecumene they chose for themselves and us, their descendants. Since 1980s, the work of geneticists has corroborated much of what archaeologists, linguists, and historical geographers such as myself have theorized about the marking of the human habitat. By using quite complex methods to analyze DNA sequences and mutations in them, which is very important, it's possible to estimate the times that two groups or even individuals have been separated from each other. This information, along with archaeology as well as sea and land features, has allowed us to determine that there were at least two migration routes from Israel. One went north and then split into three directions that eventually stretched across Europe and Siberia. At least one of those northbound routes went through the Caucasus Mountains and then split again. One path headed west across northern Europe and the other headed east across Asia and into and through the Americas. The eastern main route out of the Near East followed the coast along the Persian Gulf and then split into two branches. The southeastern route followed the coast around the Indian subcontinent and into Southeast Asia, places like Burma, Vietnam, Malaysia, making its way to Australia, New Zealand, and Polynesia. Some people following this route made good use of boats and lower sea levels that exposed land areas. They even populated the Hawaiian Islands. Because the interglacial period, the, ho the Holocene, which is what we're in now, brought warmer weather, alpine and continental glaciers melted, and the runoff caused sea levels to rise. Hawaii are now submerged under warm tropical waters. I think that's pretty impressive, really. Genetic evidence shows that it was during this period of climatic warming and coastal flooding that the South Asian route shifted northeastward along the Asian coast, the Pacific and Asian coast, and through the Aleutian Islands. The route didn't end at the Bering Strait, though. By 11,000 11, BC, not 1100, descendants of Asian hunters and gatherers had made their way to the coast of northern South America. The European migration flows followed either a northwestern trajectory across the North European plain towards Scandinavia or a Mediterranean route that went around Iberia and eventually into Ireland. By the late 9th and 10th centuries, northern Europeans from Scandinavia had settled the North Atlantic's Faroe Islands, Iceland, and then Greenland. By the 11th century, around 1002 AD, Leif Erikson and his Norse followers were in Newfoundland, that's up in Canada. It's anyone's guess what happened to many of these westward wanderers. Were they assimilated into Asian populations who had already made it to North America? Don't know. While runic stones suggesting an expansive Viking presence in North America have been proven to be hoaxes, written accounts of the Lewis and Clark expedition that explored the upper Midwest and the northern Rockies between 1803 and 1805 suggest that perhaps some of their genetic material could have been detected among the Mandan Indians. According to their accounts, these folk had light-colored hair and skin. They did not, however, have immunity to European diseases. And Native Americans, including Eastern Woodland Indians like the Cherokee and Shawnee, were still migrating when Europeans arrived en masse in the 16th and 17th centuries. The Shawnee and Cherokee were each evolving cultural groups that split off from larger Algonquin and Iroquois peoples that populated southeastern Canada and what is today upstate New York. Shawnee arrived in southern Ohio in the mid-1600s, and the Cherokee settled in southern Appalachia somewhere between 1000 and 1400 AD, or BCE for the politically correct. These two groups built semi-permanent villages along waterways where they farmed, fished, and hunted to supplement their diets with protein. By the end of the 18th century, environmental perceptions of non-professional geographers had led people to settle in places that today still marks the basic outlines of humanity's settled areas, our habitat or ecumene. 
It's an astonishing feat that our ancestors completed in 40,000 to 60,000 years. They used the products and forces of nature to shape our habitat. Still, the forces of nature were formidable obstacles to overcome and we're still trying. Indeed, many people chose not to leave the best known areas in search of new places that migrants hoped were similarly endowed with life-sustaining features and resources. Well folks, I appreciate you for joining me on this rapid excursion through the history of human migrations. I hope you'll join me again here on the Vantage Point. God bless you and yours. Bye-bye.